Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. We're very glad to have uh, Alice Deng here, and uh, she's a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley working in uh, Professor Michael Jordan's group focuses on uh, application of machine learning to uh, failure diagnosis. She received a bachelor degree in mathematics and computer science from UC Berkeley in 1999, and uh, she has also spent two summers here at the uh, MSR in 2000 and 2001 working in the signal processing group on automatic music playlist generation generator. And then she's going to talk about automatic failure diagnosis in large scale distributed system today. And um, so I think uh, half the people here are from the systems networking group, half the people here are from uh, machine learning group. It should be an interesting talk. Thank you, Yimin. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, automatic failure diagnosis in large scale systems. Um, so the main problem is is that uh, computer systems are growing both in size and complexity, and it's generating a huge amount of log data. Um, the question is, how do we make use of that data? Um, maybe we can use it to locate faulty components, detect anomalies, um, maybe do automatic configuration and administration, which is what Yemen's group has been focusing on. Um, so I'm going to talk about the problem of failure diagnosis which is, uh, I define that to be the problem of automatically locating error-inducing faults in a large system. There are several potential problems in this area. Um, one is it's a major engineering effort, effort just to obtain data from the systems. Um, and what you, uh, what you, the data that you end up with often has a long list of candidate features. Most of them are irrelevant or redundant. Um, you also have the problem of missing data. Sometimes you just don't observe the faults, or you don't observe the, the, the cause of the faults. Um, and you need, since it's a large system with a large amount of data, you need efficient and scalable algorithms to pull information out of it for um, maybe you even want to do it in the real time. So it's sort of like looking for not just the needle, but the sharpest needle in the haystack. And you want to do this quickly. Um, by the way, I don't, I don't know what the format is, but uh, you guys are all welcome to ask questions during the talk. Um, we don't have to you know, wait 50 minutes. OK. <laughs> so I'm going to concentrate on a couple of examples of systems that I've been working with for the past two years. Um, one is, the first example I'll talk about is about statistical debugging. Um, and the, the framework is that we sample program state at runtime, um, we correlate features with failure, and we rank these predicates um, that we get from, from runtime by their importance, um, their importance of correlation toward, with the failure. The second example is on uh, diagnosis on the network using Bayesian networks. Um, with we know the topology of the network, so we know the, the structure of the Bayes net. And we want to do probabilistic inference and test selection on it um, efficiently. And the last example, which I won't mention today because we probably won't have time to get to it, um, is the analysis of eBay transaction logs. It was a joint project with Mike Chen, who was here a few months ago. Um, and there we observe components involved in each transaction, and we try to correlate components with, um, with the failure and pick out paths of failure in, in particular. So let's get started with the first example, um, statistical debugging. The idea is that programs are buggy, um, but people use them. So we might as well make use of these actual user runs and make them do work for us to debug the program. The approach as I mentioned, is we first instrument the program binary um, to sample the runtime state. We collect this information, and then we apply some sort of learning algorithm on the set of, the set of both successful and crashed runs um, to pinpoint the bug. 
So a diagram, we start with, with the program source. We instrument it. We send, it, send off the instrumented binaries to these machines um, and have users run them. And there's some sort of sampling going on while the program is run. And we end up with this stack of reports from various instances of the program run. Um, we apply some sort of model to it, some sort of learning model. And we, we'd like to get back a list of bugs, hopefully. And then that goes back to the program to be where we can fix a bug. And, um, and the whole thing starts over again. Yeah? So what is it you're going to get out? Are you going to get out like stack traces that, that sort of are sh showing you where the bug is? Or are you going to like pro line, line numbers? Or what exactly do you mean by like mean... the bug? You mean the bug list? I mean, what is oh uh, uh, this? You know, when you say you identify a bug, I mean, what is it? What are you really getting? Well, because because the the information the data that we get out of the program here um, is a list of predicates that are associated with a specific line number in the program source. So we are the the bug list that we get out here is also is a filtered and ranked list of predicates. So they also have. You, you go go into them line by line. Uh, you go in, take the predicates one at a time, and look at the associated source. And if we did our job right, then that should place you in the loca where the, the bug is inside the source. So that's that's what I mean by the bug list. Okay. Is the granularity uh, line by line, or is it like ten, every tenth line? Um, the granularity is actually not. It doesn't go by line. Let me talk about the sampling framework, and then we'll probably get a better idea. OK, so um, the goal of our sampling framework is to get an unbiased look at the program um, at runtime. So what happens um, is that a large number of predicates are automatically inserted into the program. This, this happens in the instrumentation step. Um, and these predicates are basically wild guesses about what could be wrong. Um, so examples are branch statements. We look at um, whether each branch, branch statement was true or false, whether it went uh, left or right at, at that branch. Um, we look at the function return values, because oftentimes function return values indicate the, the output status, you know, uh, negative for, if it's negative or zero or positive, there are often error codes associated with that. Um, and we look at scalar comparisons of scalar pairs of scalar variables, um, whether one thing is greater than or equal to or larger or, or less than the other. And these things are um, automatically inserted into the program. So we would have sites at for every pair of scalar, comparing every pair of integer value scalars. Um, looking at every single function return value um, and every, every single branch point. Um, and there's obviously going to be a whole a large number of these predicates inserted into the program. Um, we can't afford to es execute every single one of them at runtime because that will just bog down the, the performance of the program and we, the user will just be waiting forever um, for something to, from some output. So it has to pass through some sort of sampling. Um, at runtime, what happens is we basically toss a Bernoulli coin with, probability, with heads probability rho for each of these sites. And if it comes up heads, then we sample. If it doesn't, then we, we just skip that sample. And well, in fact, um, we can get farther reduction by just sampling from a geometrically distributed random variable with has probability rho to count when is the next time we should take the sample. And basically, every, at every side, we just decrement as opposed to actually generating that random number, um, the Bernoulli random, random, the one zero Bernoulli random variable. So what we get out is a count of the number of times that a predicate is found to be true during the, the entire run of this program. No, no, we're getting a list of the predicates, and for each predicate, we're getting a count of how many, how many times it was found to be true. Yeah, I mean a list of executions of the predicate. So, so the output right. of this would say predicate 12 was true 14 times and false 36 times. Exactly. So it's actually cheaper to, to do all this, this coin flipping stuff and to decide not to 
evaluate the predicate and, and increment an in-memory variable than it is to just, I mean, the, these, these predicates that you're doing most likely, I mean, certainly the, the branch ones have to be evaluated by the program anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be more expensive to decide not to add, add one to a counter than it is to just add one to the counter. Um, well, we don't have, we're not going into the machine and actually saying, well, you know, uh, uh, while the processor, uh, while, while the CPU makes this, calculates this branch point, um, at the same time up, up, update this other register and um, just, you know, with, with, with true or false. We're, mod we're doing a source to source transformation and then passing that on to the underlying compiler. Um, and oftentimes these are, the, the predicates that we end up looking at are not things that are already computed during the run of the program. So um, that's, it's, it's it, you can't often, you can't just make use of a results that's already there. Okay. So if you're, if you're just doing a source-to-source transformation, then you have to be really careful that those things that you're evaluating don't have side effects too, right? Right. That right. sounds hard and with just looking at like C++ source code. Um, it's basically impossible to do. Um, well, so there are there is one instance where um, there is there is a bug in the program um, that putting in a, a particular return value uh, gets rid of that bug. Um, but that, that had more to do with the way that the C++ compiler, the C compiler, sorry, was um, optimizing that code rather than, so it does this transformation in C, yeah. Yeah, in C++. Um, it's really, really hard. Having, yeah, someone else is working on that, on that part. And we're not doing that yet. Okay. Okay, so. I'll briefly talk about the sampling density row. Um, this is something that controls the trade-off between the runtime overhead and data density. So um, choosing rows small enough, um, we need to choose a row that's small enough to incur minimal runtime overhead. Um, here's a plot of the, the runtime overhead for one of the programs that we, uh, ex that we experimented with, and you can uh, sorry, it's a, it's a little small, but basically uh, when you go down to sampling rate 1 in 100, so on average taking one observation per 100 sites you, you, you run over, um, then you can get down the runtime overhead to within 5% of the usual um, runtime requirement. Um, so getting it low will incur less runtime overhead, but that means we need more runs to compensate for sparsity of the data. Uh, so if, you, uh, if row is small enough, you run faster? I, I don't understand. If row is small enough, then we're taking fewer samples. Wait, and so there's. The program would have run without? No, no, no. Oh, okay. the, the baseline is 100%. Uh, so, sorry. So this is usual. The scale is part. Pardon? We've got that line that goes across there on the scale. What what is that? We can't read the number. Does that say one? Yeah. Oh, that does say one. Yeah. So never noticed that. Um, I thought the ninety-five percent is one. Um, I guess in this this case, it actually runs faster than than well, the usual. That's kind of strange, isn't it? It's, Can we crank row way down and get all our programs to run faster? Why is that strange? It could be something to do, it could have something to do with optimization of the, the program source and the compiler. It's not completely unbelievable, it's just strange. Yeah. It's, it's not unbelievable. It, it, it's it's not happened unbelievable. before. Hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not doubting that. It's just, just that data is more <laughs> You know, the first thing that you see, you think that it's a measurement error. And then if you really look at it and it turns out that it's just the cache behavior, okay, that's plausible. Sorry, we've hassled you enough. Go ahead. Um, okay. <laughs> so, 
I'm going to concentrate on some problems that we encounter um, for, for this setting. So there's, first of all, there's the imbalance problem. Um, success is much more common than crashes. So, but it's, on the other hand, it's more important to predict crashes than, um, than successes. So in some sense, the prediction of the positive class, which is crashes, more important than that of the negative class. Um, and secondly, there's the low sampling rate problem that we talked about. Um, that results in sparse data, which means that oftentimes program, uh, the program crashes, but we don't observe the cause because that pr the predicate is not sampled for that run. Um, so false, pos false negatives, which is a crash that's predicted to be a, a successful run, is, uh, is common and in some sense tolerable. Um, and more challenges come with non-deterministic bugs and the presence of multiple bugs in the program. Non-deterministic bugs are bugs that may or may not cause a crash. For instance, memory corruption bugs. Um, sometimes the program just gets lucky and uh, even though the bug occurs, the program doesn't crash and it completes successfully. Um, so this means that false positives in some cases might even, might even be, to be tolerable. And lastly, there's the, the nagging problem of, well, your program probably doesn't have just one single bug. Um, there's often multiple bugs in the program, and that causes something that we call sub-bug and super-bug predictors that often eclipse the, the effect of the real bug predictors. That's something that we'll talk about later on. So first, let's address um, the first three problems. Um, here's model one, where we apply classification and feature selection um, using a specially designed utility function. We maximize the utility um, overall. And the utility function has one term for each decision scenario. It has an adjustable false positive penalization to account for different levels of determinism of the bug. Um, and you can adjust the relative importance of positive versus negative examples. Um, and also, we use, regular, we use L1 regularization in the end to enforce feature selection. Um, and we maximize this, this utility function with respect to the parameters of the classification, of the classifier. Um, so here is the function. But I'm going to try something different this time and just look at the, the, um, the plot. So here is, let's look at this side. This is for the, the case where we're looking at a positive example. So the, it's a crash. Um, on the x-axis, or on the z-axis, is the output of the classifier. And on the y-axis is sort of the, the score of this classifier for this instance. Um, here is the 0, 1 um, binary loss function. So it's, it's, it's 1 if, if the... Um, a binary score function. It's, it's one if it's a pr correct prediction, um, the, the classifier predicting something larger than zero, and the true label is one. Um, on, the other on the other hand, if the classifier predicts something less than zero, that means the, the, it's, it's predicting it to be class zero, whereas it's really class one point, then that gets a score of zero. So this is a binary, um, this is a binary zero one loss function. What we're actually using, the utility is, po is sort of a positive curve that approximates the, the one part um, for the correct prediction case. And it's a, negative it's a negative utility, so it discourages um, incorrect predictions. And this is the logistic function. Um, and on this, case, on this hand, if it's a negative example, then um, the whole thing flips. But we also have this extra. Um, linear term that represents the false positive penalization. And we can adjust the false positive penalization um, to, to give additional discouragement towards making um, ad additional or less discouragement for po false positives. Okay. Um, so we've gone through this part, hopefully. I'm going to skip ahead and talk about the results. Here's a case study that we did on BC, the Unix calculator program. Um, 
there are a total of, we did the scalar pairs comparison um, scheme for this program, and there are about 2,000, uh, about 3,000 scalar pairs predicates in the end. Um, we had close to 3,000 trial runs for training and 300 for cross-validation um, on the classifier performance. Um, so the bug is an array overrun in the reallocation routine, more arrays. Um, it leads to memory corruption some of the time, so it's a non-deterministic bug. Um, did you discover this bug using the, your technique, or did you We didn't discover the bug? the bug using this technique, not, not in this case. Um, so Ben, my collaborator, found the bug while using BC. It's, it's so, so you already actually knew the source of the bug before? We knew the source the of the bug, okay. yeah. That's how we could, um, we could look at the results and, and, okay. and ver verify that it points to the bug. So all the top features, this is the top five features, point to um, the fact that index in this, in this function, on this line, in this file, is consistently large. And in fact, index is the index of the array that's, over, that's being overrun. And the bug is that the for loop uses um, the, wrong, the wrong stop. Than, than the actual length of the array. So the index is, in the crash runs, is observed to be larger than usual. Yeah. Are any of those terms on the right of the uh, greater than the size of the array? So the, the actual size of the array um, is ranked number eight on this list. Um, this leads to the problem that I'm going to talk about next. Um, so as you can see, so there, there are a few problems with this model. Um, first of all, the classifier allows for an arbitrary linear combination of the terms of the features that sometimes gives too much flexibility because most of the bugs are simple and involve only a few predicates. Um, and also, there's this confusion due to redundant features. So if we look, at, look back at this list, um, we can summarize the behavior by just saying, OK, index is too big um, as opposed to you know, index is bigger than this, and bigger than this, and bigger than this, and bigger than this. And it, whereas, in fact, the actual, uh, the actual predictor of the bug is ranked lower than number one on, the, on this list. Um, so these are features that we call redundant. Basically, these are um, a features redundant if there are other features that are more, sometimes more useful in locating the bug. And um, We'll, define, we'll go through and define the precise, precise sense of what's useful later. Um, but there's also other problems with multiple bugs. Um, it's a more realistic assumption um, than assuming a single bug in your program. Um, but it leads to a number of problems. So there's sub-bug predictors, which are um, great predictors of failures in a small subset of the set of uh, crashed runs. And there are super bug predictors that is a noise predictor, basically, that um, happens to correlate with a large set of fail, failed runs. Um, neither of these are very useful for locating the bug. Um, but classifiers tend to find super bug predictors for this overall effect. It, pre it sort of correlates with a large number of crashed runs. And then it picks out these sub bug predictors that concentrate on particular subsets of failed runs that don't get covered by the superbugs. Um, so here's another example. Um, MOS is a software analysis program with a large user database and a long development history. Um, there are seven known bugs that, that looking back along the, the, the history of the, the development, we can, these, are, these are the actual bugs that have occurred. So we have 32K runs. Um, of this program, which came out to be about 6.7 gigabytes of data. Um, the bugs are, there are three different kinds of array-related array bugs, two database access errors, some obscure bug in matching comments, um, and a bug in the list, list processing code. And the results of model one on MOS, the, here's the top, top 10 predicates. There's basically two categories. So the, the P plus these, these predicates, this one and that one, um, 
those are those are sub-bug pred predictors for matching the for, for the common matching for the common matching bug, whereas the rest of them, um, i greater than greater than some number, those are super-bug predictors that correlate with a large number of failures. I is basically the length of the command line, in this case, and um, this is saying, oh, when the command line is long, it seems like um, there's more chances of the program. There, when, there, when, when, when I'm given more uh, options on the command line, there's more chance of making of the program crashing than otherwise. So that's not very useful. Um, we'd like to we'd like to have a better measurement for the relevance and irrelevance for a certain predictor. So we're going to make a few simplifying assumptions first. Um, one is we're going to consider one predicate at a time. Um, do univariate tests as opposed to do this overall linear combination of features. Um, and the other thing is we, we're only going to look at the binary value as opposed to count. So we're going to look for predicates that are um, who, which when true is more likely that the program crashes than when it's false. So the first question we're going to ask is how likely is failure when predicate A, some predicate A is observed to be true? Um, so we define the relevance of A to be the probability that the program crashes when A is observed to be true. And um, one way of Measuring irrelevance is by looking at the context of the predicate in the program source. So look at, take a look at this code fragment. Uh, code fragment. Um, if the pointer is null, then we do something else, and then we dereference the pointer. Now, the something else, the variable being set equal to 0, whether or not it, it equals to 0 has no effect on, well, it has nothing to do with the bug. right? But but this is often, but because of the way this program is written, you often observe variable to be zero when the program crashes. So, but in fact, it's actually just sort of an innocent bystander on the path to failure. At this point, the, the program is already going to crash. It doesn't matter what the value is, um, uh, is set to. But the program will crash at this point. So the irrelevance of a predicate is defined to be the, problem, the probability that it crashes given that it's just observed, given that we reach that point, what's the probability that it crashes? We're not even, we don't even care about whether it's true or false or, um, or, or, or something. If it's observed, it's, if it's on the path to failure, um, then that's, that's sort of, that, that, correlates with, that correlates with the predicate, um, that correlates the predicate with failure, but doesn't contribute to the cause of the failure. So the score, the increase score of a predicate is defined to be um, relevant, the relevance of A minus the irrelevance of A. Um, this is the first stage in the second model, this is where we select the features. Yeah? Um, so we want to measure the we want to have a good idea of whether uh, a predicate is correlated with failure. Right? One way of doing that is if we just look at, um, so this, this one, sorry. So this formula um, is a reasonable thing to look at. Right? It, it says, what's the probability that the program will crash when it's true? Um, that's all well and good except for this case where, um, where the predicate is true, yeah, and, and it has a high chance of crashing, but in fact it doesn't matter if it's true or false here. Um, the, the fact that it's observed means that um, it's already on the path of failure. So just the fact that it's observed correlates with the, the crash as opposed to the fact that it's true or false. So, yeah. so what, what's true and what's, I don't understand, I guess, the difference between being observed and being true. Um, the predicate that I'm looking at in this case is var equal to zero. Yeah. Um, if it's true, 
well, it's all, this this is this predicate is always true in this code in this right here in this code snippet, right? Um, but in fact, every time it's true, the program crashes. So this this the the relevant score, um, which is the pro the probability that the program crashes when it's true is high. But it's also true that when A is merely observed, the program also crashes. So the particular value of what the predicate is doesn't matter in this case. Because it's basically just um, uh, an innocent bystander on the path of failure. So is, it, is it fair to say that the um, <laughs> predicate is both the expression you have there and the location at which it can be observed. So that's what you're trying to draw the bar equals zero on line 43. Right. In, in other words, that's, you, that's the you, you can't yeah. possibly have observed that predicate if you don't visit line 43. That's the key idea here. Right. Yeah. Right. But, you, but for instance, my problem with this definition of irrelevant is, is that on line 44, the predicate PT is null, which is also true 100% of the time. Um, would be deemed irrelevant by this too, and that's in fact the proximate cause of the crash. Um, right. No, PT, PT is equal depends to. Depends what line you're talking about for PT equals. No, that's why that's what I said if. the next it's line. It's the great one. <laughs> now, the one on the if, maybe maybe it would, would pick it out, but the place where it actually crashed, star PT, the thing that brings a program down, your irrelevance test would call a check for PT to be null as. Irrelevant, and, right. and, it, and it is there. It is there. It is there. It's, it's, there. it's two it's lines up, which is relevant. That's right. She's saying that you actually want to hear about the bug at the if, not at the point. Yeah, but I, I guess, I think the bug is dereferencing the null point or not checking to see if it's null. Anyway. Yeah, it's so um, we're trying to take into account, we're trying to quantify, you know, some, some measure of the irrelevance. If something goes wrong, there's going to be a long list of related behaviors that. That, that are correlated, and we need to pick out one of them. If you point the programmer anywhere close to that, the programmer's going to read that code and say, duh, and fix it. Right. You just have to get close. Right. Or, well, so, so yeah, so our, this, so this, this score would pick out the, um, the point that's earliest in the program, the, the earliest point where something starts to go wrong. And, uh, I think it's debatable whether um, sometimes you, you want to look at the, the point at, at which the program starts to go wrong, and sometimes you, you want the point at which the program crashes. Um, although oftentimes you can get at, it's easy to get at the point where the program crashes because that's where the stack trace will point you. It's harder to, to locate the, you know, the, the path, the, the point of divergence. So, yeah, so um, I didn't write any of this down in the slides, but um, we're, we're looking at somehow, we're, we're looking at uh, extending this to get at both the earliest point, of di earliest point of failure and the end point of failure. So somehow reconstructing the stack trace from the data that we have. Okay. So, I mean, for now, we have to pick at something. So we might as well go with the thing that's harder to arrive at with traditional approaches. Um, so we look at this increase score, which is the difference between those two probabilities that I just mentioned. Um, and we discard the predicates that have an increase score less than zero. That means there's no um, observing that the predicate is true on top of it being observed doesn't make the program more likely to crash. So those are those are the predicates that have nothing to do with the program crashing. And this is, this is similar to likelihood ratio testing. In fact, it's this criterion of the increase score being, equal, being greater than zero is equivalent to um, the probability that A is true given the program crashes being greater than the pro that it's true given that it succeeds. That's also uh, that's another way of looking at whether or not A is important um, a is changes the behavior of the program somewhat. Okay, so after we've selected this bunch of predicates, we need to rank them. Um, the ranking function has to do with notion of precision recall or uh, sensitivity and 
specificity. Oh, sorry. I've, I've actually had, the, had those two uh, reversed. Sensitivity actually corresponds to recall. Um, it's the measure of whether or not a predicate accounts for a lot of failed runs. And um, precision or specificity um, is whether or not the predicate um, is more likely to, is, is likely to predict a non-crashing run to be a crashing run. That's a, whether, or not, whether or not it has a low false positive rate. So the superbug pre predictors have the characteristic of low specificity and <coughs> high sensitivity. Um, it's correlated, it's sensitive in that it accounts for a lot of failed runs, but it doesn't, it, it also mispredicts very often and say a successful run is, uh, is, is, is crashing. So think back to, to the Moss example where, um, where the, the model picked out uh, the, some length, command line length to be long. Uh, when the command line length is long, oftentimes it means we're doing something complicated and there's a larger chance of error, but just as many successful runs have long command lines as not. Um, and subbug predictors have high specificity but low sensitivity. So these are things that hone in really well on a, on a specific set of failed runs. Um, but it doesn't take into account a lot of the other failed runs. Um, we want an actual a good balance between these two, so we use the harmonic mean, um, which is two over one, uh, two over one, the, the inverse of each of these uh, specificity and sensitivity scores. Um, here we're going to use the increase score as the measure of the sensitivity of the predicate, and for sensitivity. Um, we, we look at a nonlinear transformation of the, the, the number of failures accounted for by A and the, number of, the, the total number of failures. Um, and this choice, we, we choose this function B to be the log because that moderates the impact of a very large number of failures. Um, so we oftentimes, even a really good predicate doesn't account for all of the runs, um, doesn't account for all of the failed runs because there are multiple bugs in the program. So, in, so making the V to be the log function um, will discount the effect of larger magnitudes and focus more on the, the, the lower magnitude increases of the, of the numbers. So the overall model, model two, is first we do selection, where we select the predicates by their increase score. And then we rank them by their importance score, which is a harmonic mean of specificity and sensitivity. Um, we retain the top ranked predicate, and we discard all of the runs in which that A already accounts for. And we reiterate, um, and we recalculate importance for the rest of the predicates. Okay, and then we iterate this until Either we have no more runs or no more predicates. Um, this is essentially a greedy set covering algorithm for learning disjunctions. We basically want a, a sparse set of predicates that accounts for all the failures. Um, so a, a failure covers, uh, a predicate covers a failure if it's observed to be true in that run. Um, so every time we pull out a predicate, we will take away the runs that it already covers so that the rest of the, the, the predicates that are related to crash runs that are not already accounted for by A will have a chance to rise up to the ranks. Okay? Um, here's the results for model two on MOS. Um, it's a very short list. This is actually all that we end up with after this program, uh, after the, the, the algorithm is run. On the right-hand side, well, it's sort of a distribution of bugs. We have the ground truth of which bugs, um, of how many runs in which this predicate is, is observed to be true, and which bugs um, those runs belong to. And if you can sort of just blur your eyes and pick out, okay, large number, you know, large number, 
um, large number, large number. You can sort of see which bug each predicate accounts for based on the, the histogram on, on the right-hand side. Um, so this actually has, it, it effectively, all of, the, all of these predicates, all the top um, eight predicates, there's one each for each of the, the bugs that we mentioned. Um, there is one sub-bug predicate. Number two is actually a sub-bug predictor for the first bug that, is, that, ha that was very persistent in staying on the list. Um, whereas the actual, the actual smoking gun for the bug is um, whether uh, matching comment, the, the matching comments flag is on, that's rank number six. F is okay. less than F. How can that ever be true? <laughs> oh, this is, this, is, um, this is measuring the effect. This is the predicate that measures um, the, the value of F after the assignment versus oh, the value, okay. its value before. Okay, <laughs> okay so just to uh, review what we talked about. So this example... Um, we talked about the statistical debugging tool where we sample an instrument, we have a sampling and instrumentation framework for the program. Um, and we went through two models. One is the single bug case um, that involves classification plus feature selection. And then we discovered that it doesn't work so well in a particular case that has problems with redundancy and um, irrelevance of predicates. And also, it doesn't perform so well in the, in the face of multiple bugs in the program. So we came up with model two that has a feature selection stage. And um, it ranks by the importance score, which is a balance between um, sensitivity and specificity. So um, we conducted experiments on um, a bunch of programs and, in fact, um, found novel bugs using this approach. There's a public deployment of this tool out there. Um, and we've had, some, we've had some positive responses from the developers. So this is, this is it for the first example. Do you guys have questions for now? OK, so we'll go on to the next example. Um, in this project, we're looking at, we're doing fault diagnosis on the, on the network. And this is joint work with folks at IBM, um, the Machine Learning for Systems Research Group at IBM Watson. Um, the premise is that we, we know the network topology. So we know we can form test probes to examine nodes in the network. Um, and we know which nodes, um, we, we know how the test will affect, uh, which, which nodes the test, each test probe affects. Um, the probe outcome indicates whether or not any of the covered nodes is down. Um, which leads to a noisy or Bayesian network. Okay, so, so on the bottom level are the tests, and on the top level are network elements that we want to, whose state we want to infer. Um, each of these tests, suppose, uh, imagine that it's a network frame, that it's a network environment, and each of these nodes are, represent machines on the network, and each of these tests re represent ping requests. Um, well, each ping request uh, covers a set of nodes. Those are basically the nodes that the ping has to travel through. And if any of the nodes on its path is down, then the ping will not return successfully. So um, we can observe the outcome of each test. And we want to infer what is the most likely state for these networks, whether or not they're Zero, zero, zero means they're OK. One means they're down. Um, so um, the inference in this network is, general, is generally intractable, meaning it's exponential in the size of the largest induced clique for positive findings. Because if the probe, is, if the probe, if the probe outcome is zero, if the probe returns successfully, if it's OK, and that must mean that all the nodes are OK. Right? On the other hand, if it's, um, if, for instance, if this node returned 1, if, if, if that ping didn't return 
uh, that if that ping request hangs, then any of these nodes could have been wrong. Um, but knowing that one of these is wrong will, might affect what we think will, come, come, will be the outcome of this node, of the different probe, because these two are correlated through these, uh, the, the network elements that they have in common. Um, so in general, if you want to get the most likely state for all of these nodes, um, that's a hard problem. Um, the noisier network um, will go through and here's the defined, here's the prior probability that node X is down. Alpha is the prob prior fault probability of uh, a node being faulty. Um, and here's the conditional probability of a probe returning um, a success given a, given the state of all of its parents. So it's successful if, um, if the parent is, it, it's one, it's zero if either the parent is zero or the parent is actually one, but there's this inhibition noise that gets in the way and you actually observe a zero. So that's, that corresponds to um, two cases where, um, where there's some noise in the system and there is actually a bug, but because of these obscure noises, you don't observe the bug on the output. Yeah, the, um, the nodes, the, the X nodes, are assumed to be independent from each other um, prior. The, the, fault, the prior fault probability are assumed to be independent. But, okay. Which is not a good assumption, but um, we have to start from somewhere. All right. Okay, so um, the problem that I'm going to look at is actually how to use the minimum number of probes to ob obtain the most certain diagnosis. Um, so we have the previous probe outcome sequence, and at each step we want to select the next probe that will give us the most... Um, information about the unknown state sequences. So the next probe is picked to be the one that, that maximizes inf mutual information between X and T given what we've, what we've obser already observed. Uh, so um, the mutual information is um, turns out to be the entropy between x and t plus some constant that doesn't, that, that doesn't have anything to do with the next probe, um, with, the, with the next candidate probe. So the entropy term has, uh, has, two, has two terms plus some constant. Um, the first term, um, well, the two terms are both some sort of entropy uh, quantities that we'll talk about. But this means, this, this, this says that maximizing information gain is um, equivalent to minimizing the conditional entropy of X given T. Uh, con minimizing conditional entropy of X the network nodes given the candidate probe. Um, so let's look at the two terms in more detail. Um, the, actually, how long should I continue on for? 10, 15 minutes, okay. Um, so there are two terms, and you can blur your eyes a little bit. The, this first term is the cross entropy between um, the, probabili the probability of that whole family of, of nodes, uh, the probe node, the candidate probe node and its parents, and um, the conditional probability of what the, what the probe node will, will output given the, the state of its parents. Um, and the second term is just the, uh, the, the entropy of um, the output, the outcome of this probe given all the probes, all the probe outcomes that we've already observed. So we need to approximate each of these. Um, for the second term, we can just use, um, we use belief propagation to approximate this probability. And for the first term, we can actually do perform this calculation during the process of belief propagation, as it turns out. So 
Um, how many people here already know about approximate inference? And what that's about? Okay. Um, so the goal of approximate inference is um, is to figure out um, what the what the state of the uh, of the un, of the hidden nodes are given some observations. The observations are e. Um, we want to com compute the posterior probability of a set of unobserved nodes um, given e. So that requires possibly marginalizing other hidden nodes in the in the network. Um, and here's here's the um, the base. The, the, the conditional probability of uh, the unobserved nodes given the observed nodes. Um, belief propagation basically works by passing, passing these messages back and forth through the network until everything settles into um, a, a steady state. So suppose that we observe some output for, for the second probe, for T2. Um, T2 pass its it's what it knows about its state to its parents, and its parents um, passes on the message to the other nodes in the network, and the whole thing um, iterates until um, it converges, or if it goes on too long, then we just declare that it has diverged. Um, so belief propagation is a common uh, approximate inference technique. Um, it's not, sorry, it's not guaranteed to converge. Um, unless the, the graph is a tree graph. Um, and we can make use of it by, um, like I was saying, we can use it to directly calculate the second term in the, in, in the entropy. Um, but for the first term, we can actually make use of the same message passing uh, mechanism to, to do the computation. Um, so belief propagation updates the single node beliefs, which are um, approximate probabilities of that, the, the, the state of that node by these messages that are received from other nodes. Um, we can use this to simultaneously update our approximate term for the entropy. Um, so here's an illustration. Um, what we have is we have these. T2 is a, is a probe that's already observed. And the green nodes are the probes um, that we want to, that are, that are the candidates for the next probe to be selected. Um, so T2 will start by passing messages to its parents. And each of these, the, each of the candidate probes will act as root nodes for its cluster um, of nodes and collect messages to it and form its um, uh, entropy approximation. And so in detail, basically, we'll, we'll go through this quickly, um, we'll modify the, the original belief propagation message by um, having this extra log term. And, and then we form an approximate entropy um, using, using these updated messages. Um, and that's not quite the story because we still need to normalize in the end, but more speci but um, sorry. So basically, what we have is T is T is the candidate probe, and the parents of T um, will will pass messages to it, um, and we we come up with this final form of messages that need to be normalized before we can obtain the approximate entropy. But basically, the good thing about this is that each of these modified messages um, uh, takes time uh, that's, that's two to the order of the number of parents in that cluster of in, in, in T and in its parents. And it's a local computation, so the algorithm is easily parallelizable. Um, and we can compute the information gain for all of the nodes in one sweep, just like during the, the process of belief propagation. Um, so there's no additional complexity beyond ordinary belief propagation, which is already needed to calculate the second term anyway. Um, so we run this approximate um, version of, um, 
of, of, uh, of active probing on a set of networks that are generated from INET. Um, there are two kinds of networks that we experimented with. One is where probes are selected to um, cover the whole network, um, but not necessarily can distinguish between faults. And the other network can actually make that distinction between single faults. Um, the detection network, the, the one where um, the probes just merely covers the network, has about 500 nodes and 10 probe stations. And the, we repeat our experiments on 10 different samples of the noisy ore network. Um, and so the, the approx here's the approximation accuracy um, for term one and term two um, over different, uh, in different levels of inhibition probability. Um, and also the, the red and green lines represent two different values of the prior fault probability of our network. So you can see that it, it does, for the term one, um, it, it, at most, um, it gets up to, it gets, a, a pro, it gets the approximation within 10%, whereas for term two, um, most of the time it's okay for this, for this case where the inhibition probability is zero, it gets um, uh, 20% within the, the right answer. Um, but in fact, when we look at the diagnosis quality, we see that even though we're doing this approximate algorithm um, and things are not guaranteed to be, to be, to be true and we, have this, this, we do have noise in the approximation, the diagnosis quality is, is actually the same. There's actually two lines in each of these graphs um, representing different levels of, well, the two graphs represent different levels of fault, prior fault probability. Um, the blue line is what the exact algorithm would get. And the colored lines, the red and the green lines, um, are the <coughs> results of the, of, the, of the approximate algorithm. Um, and they, in fact, they lie right on top of each other. Um, so, so having this approximate algorithm doesn't affect the diagnosis outcome at all, which is what we really care about. Um, Similarly, if we look at the size of the selected probes, um, the two, the, the exact versus the approximate algorithm gives us almost identical answers in pretty much all of the uh, settings of the network. So here's a summary. Um, we, we want to do efficient diagnosis in the large network with known topology. Um, which means that we need some quick approximation uh, algorithm for uh, information gain. Um, we use this modified belief propagation algorithm to approximate, to approximate the entropy terms. And we find that the diagnosis quality is actually comparable to that of the exact algorithm, despite the fact that we're approximating uh, the terms. So. Um, an overall conclusion, I've talked about two examples of fault diagnosis systems. One is software debugging and the other one is diagnosis in the network. Um, and we talked about some issues of redundancy and sensitivity versus specificity of the predictors and also the efficiency of the algorithm, um, which often dictates what kind of algorithms are, are practical for, for these networks. And um, despite appearances, the two have a lot in common. In one case, we know the network topology, um, and hence we know how the test probes correlate with the network elements. And in the other case, we are, um, well, okay, in the second case, we're trying to do, we're, we're trying to do the, the diagnosis as quickly as possible using the fewest number of probes. Um, whereas in the software debugging case, um, we, we sort of know which, which predicates correlate with which program, um, with which uh, crash run or successful run of the program. Um, there's a lot of noise in that relationship and we're, we, want to, um, we want to do, we want to select, uh, select, have a very sparse set of features, uh, of predicates that account for all the failed runs and we want to rank their importance. So, um, the lessons that we learn from one system 
is carried over to the, to the other systems. Um, where do we go from here? Well, we need better and more robust algorithms in the face of noise. Um, maybe we, we can get some real world deployment um, out of these, uh, the tools that we already have. And um, also, there are also lots of other problems, problem domains and formulations that one could look at. And um, um, perhaps the lessons that we learn from here will apply there as well. So, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Alice.